Welcome to Bethel Evangelical Free Church. Uh, yeah, I sent out the email yesterday that uh, the heat is not working here, and then uh, Wayne comes in and puts the propane heater out, so if everybody dressed warm. Um, you know, the sermon was going to be pretty short because it's cool in here, but now we can go as long as we need to because it's nice and warm. So, uh, but at this time, uh, let's stand as we uh, sing praises to our, our Lord. Just a reminder to put your mask on as we sing. spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on I with Christ my Savior Christ my Savior and my
over us and knows our needs and problems even before we do. We thank you that we can meet here in peace to worship you and study your word even from home via Facebook. Good morning and have a happy and healthy new year. Pastor Paul is planning a baptismal class soon and any who would be interested in baptism please contact him for more information. There is a prayer meeting before service at 9.30, meeting in the nursery. And small group will resume Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. in the sanctuary with the entrance from the side door. It's the start of a new year, and probably some of the new year resolutions have been put off. Sometimes one may put off important things, like by faith, trusting that Jesus paid the price for our sins once for all, and there is always tomorrow. Tomorrow was too late for the people who were asleep when their condo collapsed, or the person watching TV and was hit by a random bullet, or a person driving home and they're hit by a rock thrown over an overpass, or any number of things we see happening in the news. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 13, verses 22 to 29. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west, north and south, and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for our loved ones, friends and neighbors, that God's plan for our salvation would fall on hearing ears and willing hearts. 
We pray for our prayer list, prayer concerns, and unspoken prayers for healing, comfort, peace, and salvation. I pray for Robbie's safety and physical, emotional, and spiritual health. We pray for Kenny's full recovery from his back surgery and comfort from his pain. We pray for George that the doctors plan for further radiation treatments heal his cancerous lymph node. We pray for Rosalie's nephew, Joe, that the part of the brain tumor that they were able to remove is not cancerous and for wisdom to remove the tumor completely. We pray for Gabriella, Emma, Sarah, and Joe Retig for full recoveries from the COVID-19 virus. We pray that the doctors can locate and treat the cause of Joe's uh, abdominal pain. I pray that you would give our elected officials and the CDC the wisdom to treat and end this pandemic. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, in that announcement, uh, Bob mentioned that we are going to resume small group on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to postpone it just a little bit longer because uh, it's 19 degrees is the high on Tuesday. And uh, just to make sure everybody stays safe, I know we have a couple people that uh, travel on bus and different things. So we're going to just postpone a little bit longer until we resume Tuesday Bible study. Last week, we finished up a major portion of the book of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 1 through chapter 8 gives us the doctrine, the theology of salvation. Uh, here's why we need salvation. Here's what God has done. Here's what God is doing. Here's what God will do to provide salvation for his people. Uh, these chapters are a masterful presentation of God's extraordinary work. And now this morning, we're going to enter into a new section in the book of Romans. It's going to be Romans chapter 9 through chapter 11. And while chapters 1 through 8 receive great praise, many are left confused by these three chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11. N.T. Wright says about this section, Romans 9 through 11 is as full of problems as a hedgehog is full of prickles. Many have given it up as a bad job leaving Romans as a book with eight chapters of gospel at the beginning, four of application at the end, and three of a puzzle in the middle. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that these three chapters are a postscript to the first eight chapters, while another commentary says that these chapters are the climax of the book of Romans. This is the real center of gravity. Well, which is it? Are these chapters the heart of the book? Or are these chapters a follow-up to the previous eight chapters? Or are these chapters just thrown in here because Paul didn't know where else to put them, so I'll just stick them right here? Even Chuck Swindoll writes, I will admit without shame that this section of Paul's letter contains many mysteries that I have no ability to unravel. So, you ready for a challenge? Even with the challenges that these chapters present, we do not have an excuse to overlook or to bypass this section of Scripture. God gave us His Word. His Word is truth. He gave us His Word so that we can know Him and that we can live out His truth. So what about these chapters causes so much confusion? Well, in the big picture, these chapters are about God's relationship with Israel. How did God bring together the people of Israel and the Gentiles? How can both groups be saved in the same way? Bob read from Luke chapter 13 for us, and there's going to be a group of people trying to gain access to God the Father. Who They're going to try to gain access by who they know and what they know. And they're not going to be admitted because the Father never knew them. And that's an appropriate understanding of many from Israel. As a group of people, they had a history with God, but God only has children. God does not have grandchildren. If you remember some of the background from the book of Romans, the churches in Rome, uh, that is a mixture of Jewish Christians as well as Gentile Christians. At first, the church was Jewish only. That's as they spread from Jerusalem, went back to Rome. They planted this church in Rome. In AD 49, Emperor Claudius issued an edict that kicked out all of the Jews from the city of Rome. And so that meant the church that was left was only Gentile Christians, or at least mostly Gentile Christians. 
When Emperor Claudius died in AD 54, the Jewish people started coming back into the city of Rome, and now you have the church that is a mixture of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. It's fairly well balanced from what we can tell. The issue of God's chosen people in Israel, that's going to be a fundamental foundational issue for this church in Rome. So while I don't think chapters 9, 10, and 11 are the climax of the book, I do think that they flow naturally to answer some of the questions that might have been existing in this church in Rome. Uh, as, the ha- as this group has Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians, how do we live in relation to one another? Back in Romans chapter 3, verse 1, Paul asked the question, What advantage is there to being a Jew? And he answered that question saying that there's great advantage to being a Jew because the Jews are entrusted with the oracles of God. So now that Paul has finished this first major section in the book of Romans, that is through chapter 8, he can come to this idea of the Jewish person in relation to the gospel. As we begin this section today, uh, I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, I normally preach through very smaller, much more small sections of Scripture, just a few verses here and there. Uh, but we're going to go through the entire ninth chapter today. Uh, I'm going to do this so that we don't get bogged down in the details, uh, so that we don't feel overwhelmed or too lost to continue. Again, it's only 33 verses hour and a half since the heat's on, you know, we can stay here a little longer, maybe two. Uh, we'll see if everybody can stay awake through, through this. Just kidding. Uh, so we're going to dive into this first section in Romans chapter 9. So let's look at Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Romans 9, 1 through 5. I am, the speak, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. As Paul wraps up this previous section, he tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And now Paul turns his attention to his kinsmen according to the flesh. Uh, That is the Israelites. Notice Paul's passion for this group of people. Verse 2, he says, I have great sorrow, unceasing anguish. The fact that many Jewish people do not believe in Jesus as their Messiah, it causes Paul to suffer grief. As Paul traveled to evangelize and to plant churches, his normal practice in the book of Acts is to go to the synagogue first. He first explains the gospel to the Jewish people, telling them, The Messiah has come. He wants them to hear, to understand, to receive the good news. Many of the Jews rejected Jesus as well as rejecting Paul. They many times ran him out of town, even tried to kill him, chased him from city to city. And yet here's Paul saying, I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for their sake. Paul so much wanted the Jewish people to put their faith in Christ that he wishes he could give up his own salvation to save them. We frequently pray for God to save people, but what desperation Paul prays with. The fact that he would even consider giving up his own life in Christ so that other Jews may may have life in Christ. What an amazing idea what amazing passion here's paul with love and desperation for god to do this work do we have this kind of passion do we have this kind of devotion when we pray for god to bring salvation to our friends to our family to our neighbors as paul is talking about the jewish people he outlines their privileged position in god's plan look at everything that god has done for them Paul gives a list of eight benefits that the Jewish people have received. 
They have adoption by God, the glory, which is God's presence with them. That is in the temple, in the tabernacle. They have the covenants that God made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. They have the giving of the law through Moses. They have worship of the Lord in the temple. They have the promises, the prophecies that point to the Messiah. Paul says they are also descended from Abraham. They have the 12 tribes. And the ultimate blessing is that the Messiah comes through Israel. God chose Israel so that his son would come to humanity through them in the flesh. And all of these incredible blessings and advantages that are given to Israel, and yet not all of Israel is saved. Not every person from Israel put their faith in the Lord. With all of these advantages given to the Israelites, does the fact that all of Israel is not saved, does that mean that God's word failed? That it was not successful? Well, the, that's the question that Paul answers in the next verse. Look at verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac your offspring shall be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise who are counted as offspring. So God's word did not fail. Just because people are physically from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does not mean that they belong to the Lord. God's plan is salvation by grace through faith. It is not salvation by ancestry. Again, God calls his children. Again, God does not have grandchildren. Think about the kings of Israel. Some of the kings lived lives that were submitted to the Lord, but most of Israel's kings did not. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Should those evil kings be saved just because they were descended from Abraham? Well, of course not. And neither is the common Israelite saved just because they were a descendant of Abraham. Paul does not use the example of the kings. Paul goes back further than that. Paul begins with the example of Isaac. God used Isaac as the child of promise, even though Ishmael is the child who was born first. That probably makes sense to you. After all, Abraham is born to Hagar, the servant, not to Sarah, Abraham's wife. Ishmael was conceived in sin. He was conceived in a lack of faith. And so, of course, Israel would, or Ishmael would not be the, the child of promise. Well, Paul takes us to the next generation in Israel's history. He takes us to Esau and Jacob. They are born to Isaac and Rebekah. Look at verses 10 through 13. Romans 9, 10 through 13. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. This is Genesis 25. We read that Rebekah had a difficult pregnancy. She had twins who were struggling within her. And she prays, asking the Lord about this. And God reveals to her that it's because two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. And that's the verse that continues that Paul quotes that the older will serve the younger. When Paul quotes uh, after this from the prophet Malachi, he says, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So what does all this mean? While we may be able to understand why God chose Isaac, uh, we may not be able to understand why God chose Jacob. You know, after all, Jacob is known as the deceiver. He's the trickster, the manipulator. So Esau, you know, he's a pretty good guy, but he has his problems. I mean, he's the guy who sold his birthright just for a bowl of stew. But here's Jacob. He lies. He cons his way throughout life to the point where he has to run away from home. 
He tried manipulating his way to a wife, but even that backfired. But even before their birth, God chose Jacob. Jacob would be the son of promise, and God did not choose Esau. A quick understanding of this verse that says, but Esau I hated. Uh, The Hebrews had a way of comparing priority and devotion. We are told that Jacob married two sisters. He married Leah and Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel, but he hated Leah. That's what we are told. But obviously Jacob did not hate Leah because he had several children with Leah. Uh, So that's not a hate. Uh, Jesus also tells his disciples that unless they hate their father and their mother and their wife and their children, they cannot be his disciples. So is Jesus telling us that we must hate our families in order to follow him? Or is Jesus saying that our love for him must be priority even above our families? Of all these examples, this is the Hebrew way of showing that one thing has significant priority over the other. Paul reminds us that God chose Jacob over Esau before they were even born. Even though Esau's the older, he was the one who was born first. He should have been the child of promise according to human understanding. And yet God loved Jacob. Jacob is the son of promise. Why? Well, it's not because of anything that Jacob did. They weren't even born when God chose Jacob. But God chose Jacob. Both Esau and Jacob born to Isaac. Is God wrong to choose Jacob over Esau? Is God just when he chooses one over the other? Look at verses 14 through 18. Romans 9, 14 through 18. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for, it is for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. God is sovereign. He can choose to show mercy on anyone. He chooses. God is not obligated to show mercy to a person. Neither is he obligated to withhold mercy for someone. God is not accountable. He is not responsible to us. We are accountable to him. God is God. He does whatever he chooses. And if he chooses to grant his mercy on someone, that is God's prerogative. Our responsibility that we have to God is to tell others about him. For those people who do not yet know Christ as Savior, we pray that God would intervene, that God would indeed show his mercy on them. We pray that God grants them salvation and grants them a relationship with him. This is the very freeing thought when we come to sharing our faith. You know, we don't have to have all the answers when we share our faith. We don't have to have the right words and the right formula to present. We simply share about Christ. God is the one who does the work. God's work is not dependent on whether we present the gospel without getting tongue-tied. We're just available to be used by God, and God is the one who shows mercy. On the other side, verse 18 has caused some problems for some. Look at verse 18 again. So then, God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Why does God show mercy to some and harden others? Some think that this means that God selects who's going to heaven, and then God selects who's going to hell. As we have seen in the book of Romans, uh, it's been very clear All of us are going to hell. All of us are destined for hell unless God intervenes. Unless God shows mercy, this is where we are destined to go. Thankfully, God has mercy on some. But what about this hardening? 
Does God harden somebody's heart so that they cannot respond? Leon Morris points out, neither here nor anywhere else is God said to harden anyone who had not first hardened himself. God hardening someone is a judicial act of God. Pharaoh first resisted God, and then God solidified Pharaoh's choice. His judgment came early, is essentially what this hardening is. God is not unjust to give someone what their sin deserves. John Stott says, The wonder is not that some are saved and some are not. The wonder is that anybody is saved at all. As Christians, when we read these verses, we have to absolutely be humbled. Why would God choose to show his mercy to us? We did nothing to deserve it. But God said, I'm going to have mercy on this one, and on this one, and on this one. I think of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Why did God choose to show mercy to me? Because it was the most foolish thing he could have done. He is wanting to shame the wise. Why did God choose me? Because his power is made great in weakness. Back in Romans, Paul brings up the next question, verse 19. Romans 9, 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Essentially the question is, if God chooses these things, then why are we still held responsible? Why is it right for God to condemn someone? And Paul answers that in verses 20 through 23. Romans 9, 20 through 23. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and the other for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath, and make his known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath which were prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Uh, so the illustration is pretty clear. God is the creator, he is the potter. We, as the creation, we are the clay, but the clay doesn't put itself in the position of the potter. The, the clay doesn't say to the potter, well, this is what you should be doing. That's not the position of the clay. We are not above God. God is not subservient to us. We know that God is holy, that God is just in all that he does. That is his very nature. We cannot reverse the roles and tell God what to do. I remember uh, back in the early 2000s, I was traveling in Kansas City for work, and uh, there I met one of my coworkers. We were traveling to a few of our job sites, and as we're in the car, I'm, I'm trying to tell him about Christ, and that conversation did not really go anywhere. He wouldn't listen. Uh, he had heard the gospel before. He had heard that Jesus is the only way of salvation, but he just refused to believe that. His grandmother had died not long before, and according to him, she was a good person. There was no way that she was not in heaven because she was a good person. And he became very adamant about that. In that statement, he is trying to put himself in the place of God. He was trying to determine, this is who God should have mercy on. God should have mercy in this way. And he was telling God, who should go to heaven, how they should get there. What we see in verse 22 is that God is a God of patience. Those who have not yet turned to him, he endured with much patience so that they would have a door of opportunity. There's opportunity to respond, opportunity to respond. However, their judgment will be more dire because of their continued rejection. We don't know who God plans to save. We may see somebody who is completely vile, full of sin and hatred, 
in our minds, they are beyond hope. And yet, God, in His perfect timing, God will reveal that they are, in fact, a vessel of mercy. Maybe you don't somebody like this, a person who did not want anything to do with God, who just spouted all kinds of of vile, hateful things, who uh, just indulged in all kinds of sinful behaviors, and you thought this person is beyond God's reach. Maybe even God hardened their heart. And yet, God in his patience had mercy on them. God saved them. And through that person, God made known the riches of his glory. What a beautiful testimony to God's redemptive work. These works of God that God does, it's not just for Israel. They are for us, for the Gentiles as well. Skip down to verses 30 through 33. Uh, Verses 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Uh, The verses that I skipped, they were prophecies from Hosea and from Isaiah. Uh, In these prophecies, we see that God plans to extend salvation to more than just the physical descendants of Abraham. God is going to bring in the nations. God is going to bring in the Gentiles. In the first part of this chapter, we read about all kinds of blessings, and privileges that God has given to Israel. And at the end of the chapter, we see that these blessings have become a stumbling block for Israel. The blessings become a cause of pride for them. God gave them the law, and they thought, well, I obey the law, and that's how I'm saved. They thought they could earn God's favor by works. The Gentiles, however attained righteousness by faith. They trusted in the work of God. They trusted in the mercy that God shows through Christ. Now, obviously, Paul is making some broad observations here. God saves Jewish people as well as Gentile people, and then God also does not save Jewish people, and God does not save all Gentile people. But this is what God has chosen to do. God has chosen to bring Israel and Gentiles together in Christ. Paul said that he's willing to give up his own salvation in order to save his kinsmen according to the flesh, and he's praying, asking God to show mercy on them. And for too many people, not just the Jewish people, they have a stumbling stone, a block that prevents them from seeing Jesus as the means of salvation. Too many people believe that they can earn their way to heaven They believe, well, I can do enough good. My grandmother was a good person. She can get there. I can love people enough. I can help society enough. I can do all of these good things, and therefore I will be able to go to heaven. And ultimately, all of these things will not save you. Salvation only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. The fact that we are all here hearing this message. That's an act of God's grace. It's an act of God's patience so that we can respond in faith. Do not harden your heart. If you want to know more about God, what he has done for us in Jesus Christ, you know, reach out to us. Uh, find me after service if you're here. If you're watching online, go to BethelSI.org. Just contact us. We want you to understand how we can come to know the Lord as our Savior, how Jesus saves us from our sin. It is not by doing good works. It is not by ancestry as Israel was thought that they could be saved. It is only by faith in the work of God through Jesus Christ. 
for those who are listening and you're already a Christian, this is a reminder to us just to pray that God would save the lost world around us. We need to pray that God would use us, that we would be obedient to share the pe- with people the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We never know on whom God will give his mercy. And so we keep praying. We keep sharing. And we look forward to seeing the riches of God's glory on those who receive his mercy. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, for Paul's burden that he, he shares for the lost of Israel. It is not just Israel who is lost. We, there's a whole world of lost people, people who need to know Christ as Savior. I pray that we would have this same burden that Paul has, that we would be bold in our witness, that we would pray with expectation that you will show your kindness and your mercy. And we look forward to seeing your riches poured out. We look forward to seeing these vessels of blessing and honor as you do amazing work in their lives. We thank you for the hope that Christ gives us in all things, for salvation, for sanctification, and ultimately for glorification. And we pray all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Would you please put on your mask as we stand in worship this morning?
is wonderful to be able to worship the great I am with you. As part of our tithes, or as part of our worship, we give our tithes and offerings. So if you're here in person, you can drop your tithes and offerings in the back in the giving box. You can also give online at BethelSI.org. And that, again, is just our way that we can uh, give our worship to the Lord. Let's bow for our benediction this morning. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.